Thank you, Beth. Welcome. Welcome to our service this very first Sunday of 2021. We'll start, as usual, with announcements. Uh, we have three that we are going to highlight today, although I would encourage you to read all of the ones in the bulletin. Um, if you have been missing our carry-ins, please read the announcement about the carry-around that um, is being scheduled for the 31st. Uh, let Trish Habegger know by January 10th or the church office, and um, we'll see how that works out. Snacks and scripture um, are tentatively scheduled. Uh, please be in touch and uh, keep uh, aware of um, Jake and Elia. They are uh, experiencing some difficulties with electricity this weekend, as are a number of our members. And so um, just keep in touch with them if you're interested in going to that. And finally, um, the service for Ashley Young is uh, tomorrow afternoon between 1 and 2.30 at Zion Missionary Church at uh, 111, uh, 1135 East Hively Avenue. It's just down the street to the east from here. Um, and the sanctuary is large enough for uh, careful distancing. It is good to worship with all of you, whether you tune in Saturday afternoon or evening or Sunday or sometime later on in your week. We, I pray that this service will be a right and proper blessing for you all. Will you join me in the call to worship? This is adapted from Isaiah 60 and Psalm 72. Lift up your eyes and look around. God delivers the needy when they call. Let your hearts thrill and rejoice. God will deliver the poor and those who have no helper. The nations will bring gold and frankincense before the Lord. We shall see and be radiant. We will proclaim the praise of the Lord. Will you join me in a time of prayer? God of a million billion stars, God of the noonday sun and the crescent moon, light our lives now with the light who was and is and ever will be. Light our lives with the light the darkness cannot overcome. Light our lives with the light of the life of your Son, whose birth and life we celebrate. Amen. Our song leader is Chris Habegger, and he'll lead us in our first hymn now. If you have the bulletin online, it's, uh, it's also sing the story number 29, Brightest and Death.
Our peace candle meditation is provided to us today by Theo, Theo Odiambo. It seems a strange story that does not sound right in the middle of the Christmas carols. Most of us have our Christmas trees up, well decorated with ornaments and lights to represent peace and joy to the world because the baby Jesus is born. And our hearts are full and everyone is happy for the newborn child. However, there is one man who is not happy. In fact, he is pretty angry about the whole thing. His name is Herod the Great. Herod the Great used his cruel authority and ordered the killing of all male babies less than two years of age in hope for an event he would destroy baby Jesus. But it was too late because he was already outsmarted. The wise men returned to their own country by another route. At this moment, I would like us to take a hard look inside us or within our societies. We would probably see little Herod's behavior inside of us or our societies. Herod reveals, when, uh, reveals out when I feel rather rude than ru when I would rather rule than serve. When I focus on what I own instead of what I can give. When I would rather be honored than to look for ways to honor others. When I see people as a threat instead of beloved children of God. As we light this candle today, let us remind ourselves love is more powerful than hate. And through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus demonstrated God's love that we should all follow. Will you join me in the litany? God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. Today we light this candle as a reminder of our calling. Our second hymn comes from the hymnal, number 219. Bright and glorious is the sky. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 5. And we haven't sung this since 2007, so we'll have Beth play it through with us.
In my country, I am part of a group called the Magi. Sometimes we are called wise men or even holy men. At one time, we were a tribe of priests, but over time, this has changed. Instead of devoting ourselves to the study of holy texts, we became skilled in philosophy, medicine, or even the natural sciences. I myself study the heavens. People are always looking for answers, and they look to us for many things. Some consider us soothsayers and interpreters of dreams. They believe that we could foretell the future from the stars, and that a man's destiny is determined by the star under which he is born. I can't say there isn't some truth to this, for the stars follow a natural rhythm of uh, seasons and time. They represent order in a chaotic world. So I understand why people look to the heavens to find their answers. Many times I have followed signs in the sky when traveling. One journey has stayed with me longer than any of the others, a journey to find a king. In the Egyptian month of Missouri, an unusual star arose, shining with extraordinary brilliance. We understood this to signify the arrival of a king into the world. And we were not alone. In fact, the world seemed to be waiting in eager anticipation. Many cultures had a long established belief that at this time, the East was to grow powerful and a ruler would rise out of Judea. The location of the star reinforced this direction. So some of my fellow Magi and I set out to follow the star and find this king. The journey was not quick or short, but we had prepared for the trip and we had the means to buy supplies along the way. Eventually, we found ourselves in the town of Jerusalem at the palace of the current ruler, Herod. Our arrival caused quite a stir, and upon hearing the reason for our visit, Herod sought counsel from the Jewish chief priests and scribes. Herod wanted to know exactly where the anointed one of God was to be born. The Jewish leaders confirmed our understanding. It was foretold he would be born in Bethlehem, in Judea. They quoted their religious texts. You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the leaders of Judah. For from you will come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. After gaining this information, Herod met with us privately. He asked us for the exact time that the star had appeared. We volunteered the information, but I, I felt a, a small sense of apprehension. In my studies, I spent a lot of time analyzing darkness and light. Usually I'm observing them uh, from the realm above, but there is also darkness and light on the earthly plane that is no less fascinating. It emanates from people's hearts and the nature of their character. People who live their lives in darkness or in light are very easy to recognize. They can't help but show their true nature. But those who wander between light and darkness live in the shadows, half in darkness and half in light. They are more, more difficult to see and even harder to understand. To me, Herod seemed to be such a man. He acted eager to send us on our way, even implored us diligent, to diligently search until we had found the child. But then he said something I found strange. After we had found the child, he told us to report back to him so he himself could go and worship this king. Not only did this desire strike a note of insincerity, but the light in his eyes was full of shadows. What king worships his replacement? I was more than happy to return to the road and overjoyed to see the star was still before us. We followed it to a humble cottage in the town of Bethlehem. 
Inside, we found a young child and his mother. Upon entering the home, we knew without a doubt that this was the child we sought. With great reverence, we bowed, and without an ounce of hesitation, we worshiped him. Once we had shown our respect, we unpacked the gifts that we had brought this tiny king. Our gifts were gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the most valuable gifts our country had to offer. We were touched by the family's awe and delight in receiving them. I saw nothing of what we had left at Herod's palace, no shadows, only warm, glorious light, much like the star we followed. I was filled with wonder. When we finally left and retired for the evening, I expected to fall into a sound sleep. Instead, I had a restless night and woke with the remnants of a dream still with me. I soon discovered that my companions shared a similar dream. In the dream, we were warned not to return to Herod's palace or report on the whereabouts of this child. We were in total agreement that the dream was a warning we would heed. We would make our ho way home by a different route, far away from Herod's palace. The road home gave me time to reflect on everything I had seen. The darkness I had felt in Herod's presence was unnerving and chilling. The light I felt in the presence of the child destined to be a king was illuminous and incandescent. Do you remember before when I told you that people are always looking for answers? Over the years, I have learned many things. In my travels, I have seen many more. I always seem to be on one road or another, but no matter what road I'm on, I always follow the light. What about you? Thank you, Leroy. Will you join me now in a time of confession and assurance? God of light, we confess we have gone astray and have left your light. We follow the dim lights of the world, success and fortune. We follow the dim lights that call us to be more religious by following rules. We follow the fading light of personal salvation. Forgive us for not seeking the true light of your love for all the world. Forgive us for not following the ways of Jesus who commanded us to love one another. God, call us to be light bearers of love, compassion, and justice, in which the mystery of your love is revealed. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah, we pray. Amen. Today's sermon text is Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Jake will read the Spanish translation, and I will read the English. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. 
they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may go and pay homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Jake, we await the message God offers through you today. En español, Mateo capítulo 2, versículos 1 al 12. Después de que Jesús nació en Belén de Judea, en tiempos del rey Herodes, llegaron a Jerusalén unos sabios procedentes del oriente. ¿Dónde está el que ha, que ha nacido rey de los judíos? Preguntaron. Vimos levantarse su estrella y hemos venido a adorarlo. Cuando lo oyó el rey Herodes, se turbó, y toda Jerusalén con él. Así que convocó de entre el pueblo a todos los jefes de los sacerdotes y maestros de la ley, y les preguntó dónde había de nacer el Cristo. En Belén de Judea, le respondieron, porque esto es lo que ha escrito el profeta. Pero tú, Belén, en la tierra de Judá, de ninguna manera eres lo, la menor entre los principales de Judá, porque de ti saldrá un príncipe, que será el pastor de mi pueblo Israel. Luego, Herodes llamó en secreto a los sabios y se enteró de, por ellos del tiempo exacto en que había aparecido la estrella. Los envió a Belén y les dijo, vayan a informarse bien de ese niño y tan pronto como lo encuentren, avísenme para que yo también vaya y lo adore. Después de oír el rey, siguieron su camino y sucedió que la estrella que habían visto levantarse iba delante de ellos hasta que se detuvo sobre el lugar donde estaba el niño. Al ver la estrella, se llenaron de alegría. Cuando llegaron a la casa, vieron al niño con María, su madre, y postrándose, lo adoraron. Abrieron sus cofres y le presentaron como regalos oro, incienso y mirra. Entonces, advertidos en sueños de que no volvieran a Herodes, regresaron a su tierra por otro camino. La palabra de Dios, gracias a Dios. One of the cool little gifts that Asa got this Advent season, as we are finishing up our Advent season with our final Day, our final focus on the road to radiance. Uh, I mentioned his light bright that he got from his uncle E and Aunt Amy. Some of you maybe remember light brights from many years ago. I didn't know they still made them. Uh, they used to be kind of a, a big box with uh, a light bulb inside. Now it's more of like a flat screen in keeping with the times, I guess. Uh, a flat screen, like a, a little uh, tablet almost with pegboard on it, if you've never seen one. And what you do is you would take a piece of probably black paper like this that has some little dots uh, shaped in a certain 
uh, object form that you would trace. Uh, you put this over the, the light board and it blocks the light. And then you have these little pegs that you put into the paper and as you puncture the paper, the light shining through the backside shines through those pegs and glows and creates this beautiful glowing picture. And each peg is a different color and you can do different shapes and designs. Uh, but it's, it's interesting how the pegs puncture the darkness and the light shines through, through those pegs. I thought of that this week uh, in thinking of ancient Near Easterners and how they viewed the, the heavens and the stars. And they probably viewed the stars a little bit in this way and the heavens in this way. Uh, they, they believed that the stars and the heavens didn't just reveal light, but they actually spoke and guided and revealed something beyond that darkness. Now, we moderners have more of what I would call a Pumbaa approach to the stars. Some of you maybe are familiar with the movie The Lion King. Uh, it was one of my favorites as a kid growing up. But there's two interesting characters that have a dialogue in the midst of it, uh, Timon and Pumbaa. One, Timon is this uh, kind of savvy meerkat, sort of runs the show between the two of them. Pumbaa is a... Uh, somewhat flatulent uh, warthog, and they're good buddies. But they have this conversation one night sitting underneath the stars, and Pumbaa looking up says, Timon, do you ever wonder what those sparkly dots are up there? Timon says, Pumbaa, I don't wonder. I know. He replies, oh, what, what are they? He says, they're fireflies. Fireflies that uh, got stuck up in that big bluish blackness thing. Pumbaa says, oh, gee, I always thought they were balls of gas burning billions of miles away. And Timon says to Pumbaa the flatulent, Pumbaa, with you, everything is gas. So cute little uh, interaction. We laugh at it because, of course, Pumbaa's got the right scientific view of what the stars actually are. Uh, that's kind of our, of course, modern assessment of what the stars are because they are, in fact, balls of gas burning billions of miles away. Uh, but with ancient Near Easterners, they would have viewed the stars uh, somewhat scientifically, as, as Leroy mentioned, referring to the, the Magi and their study of the stars. But they also would have heard and expected more from the celestial dance above them than simply a sort of a scientific assessment. So the Magi, as we mentioned, the, the wise men of the East would have been sort of a mixture of, of both views. They would have been both students of the stars, what we would call astronomers nowadays, uh, those who study the stars, uh, but they would have also been interpreters of the stars, what we would call today maybe an astrologer. So they were a mixture of an astronomer and an astrologer put into one. Because in the ancient world, as Leroy mentioned, the position of the stars was often associated with uh, the rise or the fall of uh, great leaders and kings. Um, so often what would happen is if a star was supposed to depict the demise of a, a certain king, sometimes those kings would actually go around and at the time when their demise was supposed to take place would actually kill off a bunch of other people in hopes that somehow that would fulfill the prophecy that the star was sort of uh, shining upon them. So there was a whole lot of stock put into this understanding that the rise and fall of kings was uh, determined or at least depicted by the celestial bodies. Now, interestingly, in the Hebrew scriptures, divining or sort of foretelling the future based on stargazing was at least belittled in the prophets, if not just expressly forbidden in the law entirely. Uh, divination was sort of forbidden in the Hebrew scriptures. But What's striking about this, when we look at the story of the Magi, is that God used this practice that would have been sort of forbidden for the, the Hebrews, used this practice to draw these, these foreign wise men into the narrative of God's Messiah or God's true king. It's almost as if to say that whatever the yearnings were inside of them, these were sort of yearnings for knowledge, a reach for, for wisdom. This is what philosophy is, right? The love of wisdom is what it means. Whatever it was that they were yearning for and reaching for, it was ultimately only fulfilled or its ultimate culmination was in this coming king, the true logos, the true wisdom of God. I think of the song, uh, come thou long expected Jesus, remember those lines? Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins, release us. 
Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, yes. But then what does it say? Hope of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation. Hope of every longing heart. So yes, Jesus was the the culmination of the yearning and the longings of, of every heart. The true king that all yearned for and all wanted. So when Jesus came and the star led them to Jesus, it was almost as if to say to them, behold the truest knowledge, behold the surest future, behold the light shining through the darkened canvas. Now the Magi, interestingly, were likely not just drawn by a star alone. There was a sort of backstory. Maybe we'd talk about it in terms of our comic books and stuff today as like an origin story uh, to their journey in which the Hebrews actually probably played a significant role to this origin story of why were they interested in the first place in a king of the Jews. I mean, the Jews were sort of this nobody people group in the midst of the Roman Empire. Um, They had very little power, very little say so. They were just a marginalized group in the armpit of, of Rome. Uh, why even be interested or how even know about their king? Well, some Old Testament options would be maybe Elisha's, the prophet, his healing of Naaman the Syrian, this, this general in the, the Syrian army who was from the east, right? Maybe it had something to do with that. Or, or maybe the repentance of Nineveh, this capital of, of Assyria at the time of, uh, from Jonah's prophecy. Maybe it was the repentance of Nineveh far in the east, right? Or maybe it was Queen Esther saving her people from uh, the people who longed to destroy them, again, in the east. All of these are options, but probably the best one and the one that I think is truest to what our origin story here is likely to be for the Magi comes from the book of Daniel. So in in Daniel chapter 2, we remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, having this dream and coming to the wise men. And guess what the term is that's used for wise men? In the Septuagint, this is like the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It uses the exact same term uh, for what we read magi in Matthew chapter 2. comes up in Daniel chapter 2 when the king calls all the wise men, the enchanters, the astrologers to come and not only interpret his dream, but he actually takes it up a notch and says, tell me what my dream was. And we remember that the, the magi are, are taken aback and say, well, oh, oh king, tell, tell us your dream and then we'll, we'll give you the interpretation of your dream. And he says, no, I've made up my mind. You have to tell me what my dream was first and then interpret it. Otherwise, I will kill all of you. So it was a pretty high stakes scenario. And they, they come back and say, king, no king has ever asked this of the wise men of their kingdom. How can you do this? And he says, I've made up my mind. Uh, your execution is sure. So in this trepidation, these, these magi uh, are wondering what is going to happen to them, that they're likely going to die because nobody, they, they say this to the king, nobody on earth could know this. Only the gods have this kind of knowledge and they don't live with us. They don't dwell here. It's an interesting introduction to, to Daniel, right, in this, in this story. So only, only a dream that the gods could reveal, the gods who don't dwell with us, all of a sudden that dream through Daniel gets revealed by the true God who does dwell near the people, right? So the God of Daniel who draws near to us is the one who reveals this dream. And what is the dream about in this moment of near death? What is this dream that almost brought about the demise of all the magi, all the wise men in Babylon? is a dream about an eternal king, an eternal kingdom, right? It was this, this structure, this um, statue that had different parts to it that represented different ancient uh, people groups or different ancient empires. And in the end, this rock comes down and, and sort of crushes them all or is stronger than all of them. And it depicts this coming king and this coming kingdom that would rule and reign forever. This is what they had in their memories. So it's probably not a stretch to wonder why all the wise men or the magi of Babylon who were saved by Daniel's God, it's not surprising that this dream of the eternal king and the eternal kingdom would have been passed down from generation to generation of magi following that moment, right? So in the darkness of exile, in this bleak landscape, it's striking that Daniel's faithfulness to God his willingness to continue to follow God in a place where that could have killed him and could have killed his followers. That's what we get throughout the book of Daniel, right? 
Daniel's faithfulness to God is like, like the punctured hole in a dark canvas, the hole where God's light shines through and shows a different picture, a brilliance far beyond it. And it's interesting that it happens in exile. That's a theme throughout scripture. Joseph, sort of in his exile, is put into a position where his faithfulness to God leads to the salvation of Egypt and to all the people surrounding Egypt because he was able to store up food for the coming uh, famine to come. This is, a, this is a theme throughout scripture. In darkness, faithfulness to God leads to light for all people. It reminded me of the, the quote in the screw tape letters, those of you that are familiar with it. I think I've shared it before. The screw tape letters are C.S. Lewis's sort of creative depiction of how interactions between sort of demonic spirits might go. And it's very, very engaging, very thoughtful, very thought provoking. So I encourage you to read it sometime. But this, they're basically letters back and forth between this sort of high level demon and this low level demon. And um, in one of the instances, they're, they're talking about. Um, when things get hardest for sort of the, the evil of the world? When are, when are things most at stake? When are things going to crumble the most for the darkness of the world? And this is what is said. It says, never is our mission more in jeopardy than when the followers of God, no longer desiring but still intending to do God's will, look round upon a world that has largely rejected them and abandoned them, and cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me and yet still obey? That is when the darkness is most in jeopardy. Is when the people of God looking around at a world that is darkened and feels like it has abandoned them and cry out as Jesus did, my God, where are you? And yet still show the light. So never doubt uh, as we come to the end of a year of deep darkness for our world, and for many people excruciatingly in the midst of it, as we come to the end of it and hopefully into a more hopeful year to come, never doubt that clinging to God in the darkness shines a luminous light into the night. And it helps to draw people, these longing followers, these that are yearning for, for Jesus ultimately, but we often don't know what we're yearning for, and they ultimately can seek the one who is shining that light through us. If that sounds like a lot of hard work, though, it's okay, because the, one of the things that we learn in this passage as well is that the light is going to exist and is going to shine whether or not we're faithful. <laughs> uh, like the sunlight above the clouds, when you can't see it, it's still there. Like when you pierce the clouds in an, in an airplane and it was gray down below and then you get up and it's just this luminous golden city of, of puffy white uh, up above the clouds. The kingdom will come even despite us. Um, others were, will bear witness to the light. Because one of the most striking features of the Magi narrative is their interaction with the Jewish leaders once they get to Jerusalem, right? The star guides them to Jerusalem. Um, they assume, of course, that the king would be born in Jerusalem. Kings are born in palaces. That's where they go. They go to the palace of Herod. They talk to Herod. And they say, where is this king of the Jews to, to, to be born? We would imagine he would be here in this palace. And so Herod calls the chief priests and the teachers of the law and says, where is this Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, according to the prophet. And then it's striking at this moment what happens with that knowledge. So the Magi believed, of course, the light that guided them to Jerusalem. And then they also believed the prophecy of uh, the Israelites, of the Jews, where that, that king would come from. And so they continue to follow that light onward. Herod also believes that prophecy and believes the light that guided them there. Uh, but he responds very differently because he's frightened by that prospect of the coming king. Uh, and so he responds in his sort of uh, power-hungry way of doing so. But the religious leaders who actually dispense this knowledge of the prophecy of the Messiah, according to the text, do nothing. Dispense that knowledge and, and stay where they are. That, that's what we can glean from the text. The Magi go and worship, Herod stews and plots, while the children of the kingdom or the descendants of Daniel are content to distribute religious tidbits and watch from the sidelines. Now, maybe it was that they couldn't actually believe that God would guide a group of uh, pagan foreigners to meet the Messiah of, of the Jews, this long-awaited coming king. 
Maybe they couldn't actually believe that. Or maybe they believed that God was leading the Magi, but they couldn't stomach the idea of sitting uh, in the light alongside of these uh, pagan foreigners, and so they preferred the darkness rather than sitting in the light next to somebody that they despised. It's unclear in the text. But maybe it was a little bit like Jonah sitting on the eastern hills of Nineveh waiting for that uh, repentant city to, to burn. Maybe it was a little bit like the brother of the prodigal um, waiting in the outer darkness and not desiring to come into the celebration, the homecoming celebration of his brother. We read this later on in Matthew. This is a little bit of what we would call foreshadowing. Um, when the healing of the centurion's servant happens, this is one of the first healings that Jesus actually does. Uh, the centurion comes and they have this interaction and Jesus is amazed by the centurion's faith. And then before he even heals the centurion's servant, he sort of gets up on a little soapbox almost to like call people around and say, hey, listen to this. This is a really important thing. You should observe what's happening here. He says, many will come from east, east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the coming kingdom of God, while the children of the kingdom will be sort of cast out or maybe even dispense themselves out into the outer darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many will come from east and west. The coming, ultimately, of the Magi is a foretaste of the coming of the good news of Jesus Christ, right? The, the light breaking through the darkness, or what Paul calls in Ephesians, another one of our texts today, look it up in Ephesians chapter 3, what Paul calls the mystery of Christ, this, this blackness of the ages that we couldn't quite figure out, we couldn't quite penetrate with our eyes, and yet there was these, these, these punctures in it that were illuminating something. There was a light coming through it, and the Magi in the East during the time of Daniel maybe tasted it a little bit when they were saved because of Daniel's presence in their midst. And the magi of Jesus' time tasted it as they, they chased the star to the west. This light shining through and this mystery that was coming through was not just that there was a king being born, that it was everybody's king was being born. That was the good news. That this is the king of all people. And in this king, we are all heirs and we are all one body in Christ. This is what Paul calls the mystery of Christ, of Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, all one spirit in Christ. And what's striking, perhaps most striking, is at the end of this passage, the Magi, after they worship, they go home. They don't stay there. They see the light, and then they take the light. It's almost like they're they're sort of like the prototype of everything Matthew knew that the disciples were to be. They were to worship this coming king, recognize that Jesus was the king, worship the king, and then go and then make disciples of, what does Jesus call them to do? Make disciples of all nations. They're like the first disciples in Matthew chapter 2, before Jesus is even in grown. Somehow they have this, this inclination, this knowledge. And this is what we are called to do as well. When we follow the light and we seek the light, and like on a, a Christmas Eve service that we couldn't quite do it this year because we were outside and the wind was blowing, but when we stand around our sanctuary and so many churches do, do the same, there's a light that shines in the darkness and then that light is passed around and that light goes around and it illuminates the whole room. And then those of us with that light, we take that light to our homes, and we take that light to our schools, and we take that light to our workplaces, and we take that light with us wherever we go, shining a light that says, this light is the light of all people. And you and I are brothers and sisters, and this is our light, and all of us see by this same light. And this light is Jesus, the Messiah, the King of the Jews, but the King and the desire of all nations. May it be so. May we celebrate that this season Amen. Let us respond by singing in Sing the Journey 95 or your insert, I want to walk as a child of the light, verses 1 and 2.
prayer I offer um, this morning or evening, as you find it, is from uh, Malcolm Wheat, singer, songwriter, and poet. This is from his antiphones. This is titled, O Emmanuel. Let us pray. O come, O come, and be our God with us. O long sought witness for a world without O secret seed, O hidden spring of light, come to us wisdom, come unspoken name, come root and key and king and holy flame, O quickened little wick so tightly curled, be folded with us into time and place, unfold for us the mystery of grace and make a womb of all this wounded world. O heart of heaven beating in the earth, O tiny hope within our hopelessness, come to be born, to bear us to our birth, to touch our dying world with new-made hands and make these rags of time our swaddling bands. Amen. Today's benediction comes to us from Isaiah 60. People of God, people of the road, arise and shine. Go forth in the radiance of God, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Thank you.